in this segment. Manisha joins us to answer some viewer questions. All right, Manisha, thanks so much for sticking around. The first question comes from Christy via Twitter. She writes in asking, is it better to pay cash or use a credit or debit card for everyday purchases? You know, I've often wondered this myself. Mm. Christy, it's a good question and it's an, it's an interesting question because Academic research shows that when you pay for purchases with cash, you spend less money. And depending on the study, it can be significantly less money, anywhere from 10 to 30% less because it's painful to pull out the cash. However, uh, there's also a downside to paying with cash, which is that those transactions aren't recorded in your credit report, so they're not helping you build uh, a credit score. So if you are one of the folks who are really trying hard to live within your means, one thing that I personally use is a charge card so that I'm making um, payment, I, I'm charging items on my card, I have to pay it off in full at the end of the month when the bill comes, so I'm not tempted to spend more than I can afford, but I also get the added benefit of having my transaction history building up my credit score at the same time. Makes total sense. All right, next question comes from Leonard. He writes in via Facebook, are there certain purchases that it makes sense to finance instead of paying for in cash? I guess a home would be the most obvious, if you can. So. Yeah, Leonard, I love this question because in the 80s and the 90s, when the stock market was going up at 18, 20% a year, people said, oh my gosh, you should buy everything on debt. If you can borrow money at 5, 7% for whatever, electronics, clothes, furniture, do it and invest the difference in the stock market. Then we went through this lost decade where stocks went almost nowhere, and so people really started to rethink that. But with the surge in the stock market since lows of March 2009, I'm starting to hear more and more people ask me, does it make sense? And I really believe with the exception of your home, your education, and a starter car, not a glamour car, a starter car, those really are the only three things that it truly makes sense to, to finance. Everything else, please wait until you can afford it unless it's a life or death emergency. That's very, very good advice, Manisha. All right, now Susie writes in, she emails in, I live in Manhattan and you keep saying people should save 15% of their gross income, but there's no way I can do that. What am I supposed to cut back on? I live alone and barely splurge on anything. I love the fact that she, she makes clear, she lives in Manhattan. It's one of the highest you know, rates of living here in, mm -hmm. in the city. I can totally sympathize. <laughs> Well, and Susie, I'm high-fiving you for remembering that I say, say 15%. I'm glad that number has stuck in your head. And you know what? It's tough. I hear this from people who live in Manhattan, San Francisco, other high-cost areas of the country. Basically, life is a series of trade-offs. And if you live in one of these high-cost cities, it is entirely possible that 50% of your take-home pay is going towards your housing. And you mentioned something very important. You said you live alone. And so the price for not having to share that bathroom um, is pretty stiff. And it's your choice. That may be what you need at this stage in your life. If saving is really important for you, then having roommates may be something that you want to consider um, well into your working years. And again, it's just a trade-off of living in a high-cost city. Absolutely. All right. Ken writes in via Facebook, I've been unemployed for nine months. My benefits have run out. I have some CDs and a traditional IRA. Which should I tap into first? Well, we're very sorry to hear that about Ken. A lot of people in similar situations, though. Ken, and I am thrilled you are in a very lucky position that you actually have some savings to tap into, so kudos to you for having been disciplined enough to build that up. My advice would be to tap into the CD first. You will pay a penalty if the CD is not about to mature, um, probably one to two months interest, but that penalty will be significantly less than the 10% plus taxes that you'd pay on your traditional IRA. If you had said you had a Roth IRA, that might change the equation a little differently because on a Roth, you can withdraw your contributions, but not earnings, the contributions um, without paying a tax penalty. So for you, start with the CD on the taxable side. All right. E Amy emails in asking, what kinds of institutions use credit ratings to make decisions about what they will grant people? What kinds of decisions are made based on my credit ratings? A lot of people want to know this because a lot of people are struggling with credit ratings and credit scores right now. Yeah, I mean, people are just taking the one-two punch all over the country. And so um, here's the bottom line. A lot more folks and a lot more situations than you may have thought. 
So traditionally, credit scores were looked at by lenders, people who were loaning you money to buy a home or a car. But it's extended way beyond that over the last 10, 15 years. Now insurance companies look at it to decide what they're going to charge you for car insurance, homeowners insurance, saying if you're not responsible with your money, maybe you won't be responsible with other assets. Um, cell phone providers, landlords are looking at it, and even some employers. All right, Manisha, thank you so very much for taking the time to answer our viewer questions today. And if you would like to submit a question, go to our website, abcnews.com, and click on the money page to ask our team of personal finance experts your questions. We will do our very best to answer them right here on Good Money. ABC News Now. Good to know.